Hello again, this is your friendly neighborhood host, J.T. Wheatley, back for another episode of the History Comics Podcast, this time with the life of John Romita Sr., the quintessential Marvel artist. Of the many great artists Marvel Comics benefited from during its revival in the Silver Age, one of the most significant was John Romita Sr., Beginning at Timely Atlas in the 1950s, when comics were just on the downturn from the Golden Age, he would later rejoin Marvel in the comics in 1965, literally picking up the mantle of Spider-Man from co- his co-creator Steve Ditko, and carrying our favorite wall crawler through some of his most iconic stories, to the introduction of Mary Jane Watson and the revealing of Norman Osborn as the Green Goblin. It wasn't just Spider-Man that Romita would contribute to, as he would soon set the art style for the company for decades, creating the Marvel look we know and love today, along with many of his characters, thus making his own place in comic book history. John Romita Sr. was born on January 24, 1930 in Brooklyn, New York, the son of Maria and Victor Romita, a baker of, of Italian descent. He had three sisters and a brother, and by age five, he started to show his talent for drawing. According to Romita, he became something of a street performer by age 10 with his chalk drawings on the streets to entertain friends and uh, neighbors. However, he, was, he grew up so poor he had to scrounge for bits of plaster to draw on sidewalks because he couldn't afford actual chalk. Of his works, Romita did a 100-foot drawing of the Statue of Liberty on the streets of New York, which he knew was that length because that was how far between the manholes in the streets were. Romita also enjoyed drawing superheroes and bought a copy of Action Comics number no. 1 just so he could trace the cover over and over again. And it's also why he's not a millionaire, because that copy was obviously worn down. He also loved the works of Charles Burrow's uh, Daredevil comics, which had no relation to the future Marvel character that Romita would eventually become famous drawing for. This was created by Jack Bender and Jack Cole, and used the boomerang as a weapon. Romita loved Biro's work in general, pointing out the writer did a lot of things with the character and story that Stan Lee would innovate decades later. Stan Lee himself would call Charles Biro a genius. The artists he most admired were Jack Kirby, George Tuska, especially his work on Charles Biro's Crime Does Not Pay in Daredevil comics, and Milton Kniff, who Romita called his god. When Romita was 14, he delivered boxes of miniographs for big bang news like Louis Armstrong and Glenn Miller for money. Around the same time, Romita's father, Victor, opened his own bakery, which required his family to move to Albany, New York. However, Romita's mother, Maria, objected to John moving, insisting he stay in Brooklyn to become an artist. Originally, Romita wanted to become a magazine illustrator. At school, he painted backgrounds and scenery for school plays, along with murals of heroes like Zorro and Tarzan. He also carved heads from soap, like Abraham Lincoln and Mickey Mouse. These became so popular with his fellow students that they broke into a Turkish bath to get more soap for him to carve, only for the police to get involved. Romita Sr. did say at one point a local priest tried to get him to join the priesthood over incidents like this, but he passed because he didn't want to go with girls. John Romita Sr. started at the Manhattan School of Industrial Arts at age 17 in 1947 after he graduated from high school, where his classmates were Joe Giala, Lester Zarkin, and Wilton Gaff. Their instructors included comic book artist Howard Simon and magazine illustrator Ben Clements. However, Romita also learned by mimicking his favorite artists, such as Milton Kniff, who he grew up admiring his work of Terry the Pirates and Steve Canyon strips. It was here that Romita said he learned how to draw blacks and anatomy, especially the correct way a hand gesture should make. He also learned to draw people who looked at each other while speaking. Romita Sr. would later pay tribute to Kniff in Amazing Spider-Man number 108 and 109, which he counted as some of his favorite stories. Meanwhile, Romita got his first job for an anesthesiologist at Manhattan General Hospital, where he designed boards for hospitals at uh, $6 a week, while also providing art for medical books for other doctors at the hospital. As for the comic books, Romita nearly broke into the industry in 1949 with Famous Funnies, considered the first modern American comic book. He credited Stephen Douglas with his first story, a romance that Romita looks on in shame now, calling his men looking emaciated. Douglas paid him $200 for the story, but it was never published, which Romita was also grateful for in all counts. Romita's next break came when his old classmate, Lester Zakarin, came to him in 1949 with an offer to ghost pencil his work on a 10-page story at $17 to $20 a page. At the time, Romita was making $30 a week doing Ford's lithographs, so he naturally took the job. With Zakarin claiming they were his pencils to Stan Lee, who was one of the few editors at the time who requested changes, forcing then Zakarin to go back to Romita to make them. While well, Romita also did the inking as well. Romita would later claim that Zakarin just couldn't draw it all. 
This led to Romita joining Timely Outright in 1951, beginning with his first professional inking job on the story of It in Strange Tales No. 4, December of 1951, about a murdering alien baby. There, Lee set up a meeting with Joe Manley that helped Romita improve his, me- improve his technique and to meet deadlines. Romita would later say working with Manley for one afternoon was the equivalent of a six-month art course, as he watched Manley pencil and ink an entire double spread with no reference in a day. Ramita also observed how Manley was able to insert bone structure into his figures, thus making everything look round, look round but crisp, as he would describe it. Ramita's work and confidence immediately improved afterwards, and he even switched to inking with a pen over brush, as Manley did. Tragically, Joe Manley died at the too young age of 38 in a train accident. Ramita was still ghosting for Lee... Sakara and for Trojan and other comic book companies on books like Crime Smashers, eventually he would, they would be signed Zakara and Ramita, while also making $25 a week doing Coca-Cola ads, and also work at Avon during this time, doing Western comics like The Western Kid. His collaboration with Zakara would finally end in the spring of 1951 when John Ramita Sr. was drafted into the U.S. Army. Wanting to avoid getting sent overseas, he managed to show his artwork to the Air Force captain at Governor's Island, who pulled some strings to get him assigned there. He was stationed at Camp Upton doing, during his basic training at Fort Disk in New Jersey. During this time, he married Virginia in March of 1952, and he thought he accidentally deserted when he went on his honeymoon in Canada. The couple will eventually have two sons, Victor and John Jr., the latter who became a legendary artist in his own right. Ramina was made corporal in seven to eight months and made Class A, which meant he could leave his post when off-duty and even live off-base, so he could still work at Timely, delivering completed pages while still in uniform, resulting in the secretary at Timely to call Ramita his G- G- Stan Lee's GI. There he would talk to Stan Lee about future stories while renting an apartment in Brooklyn. When word got out about this and that he was making more money in a week than his fellow servicemen did in a month, Ramita said he became suddenly unpopular on base. Ramita would eventually serve 24 months and was offered the rank of Master Sergeant but turned it down, which angered his father as he thought a career in the Army would be a more stable one, especially since it came with a salary of $488 a month, which his father thought was a fortune, despite the fact that Ramita was making more in comics at the time. John Ramita Sr.'s most significant work at, for Timely, now Atlas during this time, was penciling the brief revival of Captain America under editors in Chief Stanley in Young Men number 24 to 28, December 1953 to July of 1954, and Captain America number 76 to 78 in May and September of 1954. Romina would work on other superheroes during their brief revival of the genre, one of which introduced M11, the human robot, in Menace number 11 on May of 1954, a character who would eventually turn in Agents of Atlas decades later. Soon he noticed his style was imitating his idols, Jack Kirby and Milton Keneef, but he would later learn to adapt their style while making it his own. Another significant work for Ramita worked on for Atlas was at the time was Jungle Comics, which starred Waku, Prince of Bantu, who was originally created in Jungle Comics No. 1, September of 1954, by writer Don Rico and artist Odin Whitney, noted for being one of the first comic book features to not only have a black character as a star, but no regular white characters. Ramita took over the art chores for Whitney with issue number two. At the time, Stan Lee was doing very detailed scripts before adapting to the Marvel method, thus Ramita didn't have the freedom with his art he would later achieve. When he was assigned to Captain America, he tried to avoid ways to draw with S.H.I.E.L.D., even, even going so far to have it color-held, which didn't work out too well. Despite all this, Ramita didn't think comic books would last by the end of the 1950s, and soon events would nearly prove him right. After the publication of Seduction of Innocence by Frederick Wervin in 1954 and the following Senate Subcommittee on Juvenile Delinquency, the comics industry formed the Comics Magazine Association of America in 1955 with the Comics Code Authority tasked to severely strict the medium's content to stave off the backlash against the industry and governor censorship. Artists like Ramita were powerless against this, though he would play a hand in his downfall years later, and in 1957 it would be the low point of his work with Stan Lee at Atlas, former Timely and current Marvel, as Lee had to cut his rate of $44 to pay to $24 to pay, leading Ramita to quit the company until 1965. Of course, his father chided him about all this over leaving the army. He wasn't the only one, as this led to a mass exodus for, exodus for many artists, as Atlas was nearly folded up shop and Ramita was forced to take a newspaper route just to make ends meet in the late 1950s, while his wife Virginia also went to work. Eventually, Ramita was able to get, get work at DC doing romance comics in 1958, having previously freelanced for the company while working at Atlas earlier. 
His first credited work was the cover of Secret Hearts number 58 on October 1959 and the seven-page story I Know My Love and Heart Throbs number 63 on January 1960. Romita hated these stories, calling them stale in the comparison to his previous work at Timely. Nevertheless, his work on romance comics would help him with creating glamorized art, notably in being able to draw beautiful women, something that will help his later clear. Much of this came from Carmen Infantino, who helped him with the female form and looking to artists like Don Heck and Bob Oster for inspiration. Soon, John Romita Sr. would be known for his Romita women, which ranged from sultry street smart to the ladies to the girl next door, noted for their intelligence and realism. This would lead him to be stereotyped as a romance artist for a period of time, though he did lead him making $35 to $38 per page on these comics. At DC, he didn't like doing horror stories and strangely never got a chance to do superheroes. One could only imagine what he could have done with Superman or Batman, though he did get a chance to do more obscure metamorpho. However, with the romance genre dying out in comic books, Romita Sr.'s work at DC dried up. The last known uh, issue he worked on was My Heart Tricked Me in Girls Romance Number 121 on December of 1966. Soon, Romita was thinking about going into advertising at BBD&O, which offered him $250 a week against the $200 he was making for DC, before Stan Lee made him a counteroffer, promising him a ton of work, and he wasn't lying. While Romita said Stan Lee constantly pushed for changes, he was more accepted than DC, and he did like being challenged by artists. It was there that Romita was indoctrinated to the new Marvel method, where Lee gave outlines of the plots to the artists, trusted them to design the characters, setting and panel layout, and then come back to insert the dialogue. Between Lee's writing and Jack Kirby's story templates, Romita transitioned back into story- superhero storytelling. Romita's first inked an issue of Avengers number 23 in December of 1965 for Don Hex and Terrio Pencils, along with a Jack Kirby cover, and would then replace Wally Wood on Daredevil with issue number 12 on January of 1966. The return to superhero stories would be a bit of a transition, as the first three pages Romita produced had to be thrown out as they were too boring like a romance story. Stanley had Jack Curry provide breakdowns, but provided Romita a reference on how to do the pacing. Soon, Romita got back into the groove and the sales for Daredevil started to go up. Along with producing stories for the Hulk and Captain America in Tales of Astonish number 77 on March 1966, and Tales of Suspense in number 76 and 77 on April and May of 1966, respectively. With this, Stan Lee soon had a new job in mind for Romita, as he wanted him to take over penciling Marvel's flagship character, Spider-Man. During John Romita Sr.'s run on Daredevil, Stan Lee had Spider-Man guest star in Daredevil number 16 and 17 in May and June of 1966 to give Romita a trial run on how he could do the character, as he was having trouble with amazing Spider-Man artist and co-creator Steve Ditko. One argument specifically was that Lee wanted the Green Goblin to be real to be Norman Osborn, the father of Harry Osborn, Peter Parker's friend. Ditko objected, stating that that was unrealistic, since most criminals were people you never knew, but Lee argued that readers would be disappointed if it didn't happen. When Ditko finally left of Amazing Spider-Man number 38, the Green Goblin's identity was still had yet to be revealed, and Lee was free to have him be Norman Osborn once John Romita Sr. came on board. However, Romita originally turned down the job as he thought Spider-Man Peter Parker was just a teenager Clark Kent while he felt at home on Daredevil. Nevertheless, when he did start on Amazing Spider-Man with issue number 39, which revealed Harry Norman Osborn to be the Green Goblin, Romita would try the Ghost Ditko style for six months before realizing it was no longer a temporary gig at issue number 43. He couldn't believe Ditko would leave one of the top-selling comic books in the industry. Once he realized this, Romita started delivering his own style since drawing characters with bone structure along with ditching the nine-panel page structure. It was during his early run that he debuted the first full appearance of Spider-Man's future love interest and wife, Mary Jane Watson, seen previously appearing obscured by a plant in Amazing Spider-Man number 25 in June of 1965. Romita would debut in the iconic final page of Amazing Spider-Man number 42 in December of 1966. Playing on the subplot of Aunt May trying to set up Peter with their neighbor's niece, he opens the door expecting a comely girl only to see MJ in all her red-headed, bomb-shared glory, spouting the iconic line, Face it, Tiger, you just hit the jackpot. Romita's previous years working on romance comics had helped, and he developed a talent for drawing beautiful women, and Mary Jane Watson was no exception, modeling her after the film star Anne Margaret. It was perfect timing for Amazing Spider-Man as well, as all the young boys who started reading the book were now young teenagers and with a newfound interest in pretty girls. 
Soon, John Romita Sr. was making Amazing Spider-Man his own comic, putting his own mark on all the characters. For example, he modeled the look of Captain Stacy, the father of uh, Spider-Man's girlfriend Gwen Stacy, after the actor Charles Bickford. Soon, Peter Parker was getting more handsome as he 